Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Meaty Meat episode number three. Three, yeah. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I had to count to three in my head real quick, Thad. <laughs> our first know. time on our new site. All right, I'm, I'm not getting any sound. Are you getting sound, Thad? Yeah, I can hear it on the live stream. Yeah. Yeah, I can hear it. Oh, uh, it's be. Oh, there it is. All right, I can hear it now. I said our first time on our new site. That's not. That's not what I meant. I was distracted. It's because Thad's computer was speaking, and I heard myself speaking, and so <laughs> Thad distracted me. It's my bad. Don't do that anymore. All right, man. I won't do it anymore. Hey, Thad. Do those glasses have uh, lenses in them? They still have lenses in them. Okay. I don't know if you can. Well, don't mess them up. Nobody would be happy about that. Still our there. first, our first meaty meet on the at the new time. The new time, Thad. The Woo! time has changed. Hey, show everybody's. Uh, anybody's wondering. Uh, we don't ever leave the church building. Um, we just sleep here, and, you know, live here, and brush our teeth here, and you know, all kinds of stuff. This is just where we are, mm. all the time. <laughs> I'm here sometimes. <laughs> yeah, we've got like couches and stuff. We could just, you know, we have a, Thad and I have an infinite, uh, um, what do they call that, uh, lock-in. An infinite go. infinite <laughs> lock-in. <laughs> when Faye leaves at night, she locks us in and we can't leave our offices or else the yeah. alarm will go off. Yeah. They gave us keys, but they're just toy keys. They just wanted to make us feel like we you know, actually had keys. They're like, you know how you give like a child keys, but they're actually like plastic? That's what our keys are. We can't get out. Yeah. Yeah. We can't leave. Oh, well. It's fun. Hey, we're just kidding, everybody. We go home every now and then. We enjoy to go home. And, <laughs> every now and then. Yeah. But yeah, hey, it's our new time, 6 o'clock. On Tuesday evening, so every Tuesday evening we will be here with you at 6 p.m. If the Lord wills. And um, it will be studying from God's Word, taking the meat of the Word, and delivering our thoughts live on a virtual meet. This is a good time. We have a good time doing this. And uh, we need your help. We need verses. We need verses to study. Um, tonight we're going to study a verse that was submitted the very first episode, our introductory episode. Can we call it the pilot? The pilot. The pilot episode. Are we naming these episodes? We could just name them by verse. By verse? Yeah. That's no fun. We we need to come up with something more creative. Uh... Like tonight's episode can be um, uh, weep, weep, weep. You know, uh, some, something like that. Is that not very creative either? Poems from a punished people. Oh, you like the alliteration. <laughs> All right, over there, President Dr. Kirk Brothers. <laughs> All that alliteration. Tell the people who, pre who uh, President Kirk Brothers is, for those who don't know. President Dr. Kirk Brothers is the president of Heritage Christian University. I spoke about him last night on uh, on my presentation on lessons on leadership. He is one of the all-time greats. He is a, a giant of the faith. We appreciate his work. And he's been influential to Thad and myself both, so... Um, he never stops working. <laughs> he never stops working. He never leaves the office. I, I know that to be true. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Okay, what did you say? Uh, punishments of a, a, or prophecies of a punished people. Poems. Poems. From a punished people. Yeah, because I guess this wouldn't really be classified as prophecy. Uh, it, I think it's it's poetry. Yeah. De no, definitely poetry. Um, well, let's tell them what we're what we're studying. Well, maybe you noticed it. It came up in the countdown there. Mm -hmm. But tonight we're looking at the Old Testament. First time in the Old Testament. It's actually our first time out of the Book of Philippians. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, 
We could we should have just stayed there and did like every single verse every do you think we would have had viewers still afterwards? Yeah, Philippians is a good book. Yeah, it's great. It's my favorite. It's my favorite. You know. Every single verse over and over over again. Just stay there. We would have actually made it quite far. We made it many, many, many weeks. But um but we're leaving Philippians tonight. Sad. It makes yeah, me want to say it's a shame. <laughs> it makes me want to lament. <laughs> see what you there. And uh, we're heading to the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament. I love the Hebrew language in the Old Testament. There's a lot of wordplay and a lot of different literary devices going on. Hebrew is a cool language. You read it backwards. You do well. Maybe we read English backwards. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Uh, it has 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, if any of you who are watching can tell me why it is important to the lesson tonight for us to have said that the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters, let us know. By the way, in order for you to know why it's important, you have to know the book that we're studying in the Old Testament, that it is... Lamentations. Lamentations. Yeah, that number 22 is important for all but one of these these uh, chapters poems that we're going to read. Chapters poems. We're gonna read. Oh, we just gave it away. Oh, did we? I don't know. Did well, we no, give it away? So we, we didn't. We didn't say what type. What? What? Yeah. It is a poem, but it's it's specific. They, we didn't give it away. Don't don't give it away. Give it away. Give it away now. <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't give oh, it away. Oh, we just gave it away. Oh no. Oh, well, we did. <laughs> that was me saying that over again. Okay, so Lamentations. We're looking at chapter three, and Thad said something super key to our study. He said five. What was that word you used? It was. Uh, it's important to. Um, one all but one of the uh chapters <laughs> you said poems you said poems sad we're that confusing our own there. people right now we're confusing well, them it's important it's important for all but one of the five poems okay which just so happens to be the poem that we're studying <laughs> all right so all right so there are there are five chapters in the book of lamentations and five poems in the book of lamentations so lamentation is not necessarily a prophecy although there's some poetry in here that you also find in the old testament prophecies did that make sense mm. there is poetry in this book lamentations similar to the type of poetry you would find in the prophets, like Isaiah or um, uh, Habakkuk, Habakkuk, uh, Micah. It's so much more fun to say it that way. <laughs> it is. Habakkuk. <laughs> Habakkuk. Uh, I think that's like closer to the original anyways. Yeah. Habakkuk. You got to say it with like a, a guttural there. Habakkuk. You know. Yeah, there's a, a lot of phlegm in Hebrew. <laughs> so uh, Lamentations has five chapters it is a poetic book um, the title of it really gives away what the book is about um, mm -hmm. it's a, a lament you know right. a crying out um, actually like the, the title in Hebrew I found this super super fascinating but the title in Hebrew is from the word Echa, okay, and well, um, thank you, Thad. <laughs> and this word literally means, um, like, it literally means how, but like with an exclamation point. You know, like I'm crying out, "How could this happen to me?" Uh, you know, or um, or it literally means, "In what way is this happening?" You know, in what world am I having? such a terrible time and uh interestingly enough that that's the title of this book in hebrew how 
you know, how. And um, that's the same word that's used in the first verse of chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 4. And so um, this was like, a, it was the stereotypical way of opening up, um, or the, it, it was the stereotypical word, rather, um, for a, like a dirge in ancient times. So you would see like in the Talmud and different uh, rabbinic writers uh, would, would, when they were lamenting or writing like a dirge, um, they, would, they would use this word to begin. How? How could it be this way? And, um, and, and so it's this, it's this opening of this great lament, this great crying out, this great dirge. And actually, like, I would say, I don't know, maybe next to Judges, Lamentations is like one of the most depressing <laughs> books of the Bible. But I mean it's it's written about a I mean up up to that time it's it's written about the nation of Israel. Mm. Right? And up to that time uh what this book is written about is probably one of the most catastrophic things ever to happen to the nation of Israel. Yeah. Uh, right cuz it's it's you know it's written about an event that happened in 2nd Kings, 2nd yeah. Kings 24 24 25 um, and it, the the writer who it's it's written by an anonymous writer. Some people think it's Jeremiah. Some people don't think it's Jeremiah. Um, but the writer is reflecting on this event that happened, where the Babylonians laid siege on Jerusalem and just that place got messed up. Yeah. So up to that point, that's the most catastrophic thing that had happened to the nation of Israel. Yes. Right. So you can imagine these people are devastated. Right. Right. You've got, you know, people who are wealthy and rich who are, you know, looking for scraps of food and whatever they can find. You've got, you know, holy men who are, you know, unrecognizable and just, you know, depressed. And you've got your king that, you know, who is, you know, being led away and treated like a slave. And, you know, it's just not it's not a good time to be an Israelite, you know, but there's a reason that it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're going to get into that in a, in a little bit, but there is a reason that it happened, and uh, one of the points that we're going to make tonight is is it comes from that that reason why it happened. Yeah, so you have this uh, the Assyrians come in and capture Israel in 722 BC, uh, 721 22, I, I um, somewhere around there, and then um, and then you know over a hundred years later the Babylonians come in and attack Jerusalem in 587 B.C. And they completely, you remember uh, B.C. Um, goes backwards in time. So as the number gets smaller, 722 to 587, as the number gets smaller, we're getting closer to the time of Christ. Okay, The smaller the number, it's a future event. All right, for, for their time. So 587 happens at a later time in the future from 722. And um, you have the Babylonians coming in and laying siege and like destroying and leveling Jerusalem out, destroying the temple and everything. And, um, and you know, it was there, it was there 9-11. Um, yeah. But on like this great magnitude where they had a 9-11 every single day. And here you have these prophets of God, um, like the prophet that Lamentation is, Lamentations is attributed to most of the time, uh, Jeremiah. You have these prophets of God like Jeremiah who is watching this entire event unfold. And he's sitting there vowing his allegiance and commitment to God. And he's watching as... God's people are being utterly uh, upended and destroyed, just completely um, isolated and killed in the streets. And, um, you know, you talk about governmental oppression, you talk about loss of life, you talk about loss of freedoms and liberties. This is a loss of freedom and liberties. Right. And Jeremiah uh, if in fact he writes the the book Lamentations, is in five poems, you know, one in each chapter, he's sharing his distress and anxiety 
and lament over everything that he's watching go on. You know, he, he lives in easily one of the worst times in all of history for the people of God. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that today's times aren't, you know, they're certainly unchartered. Um, they're certainly difficult to us in many ways, uh, but they're nowhere close to the worst times ever. Uh, mm-hmm. Nowhere close to the worst times. When you look back at not only the persecutions that, that God's people went under in the Old Testament, 587 B.C. and being captured by the Babylonians, uh, but the times of Christian persecution and uh, the times of of Nero and Domitian and these uh, Roman emperors um, domineering over the empires and persecuting Christ followers and killing them to the death. Um, you know, these this is nowhere near the today's times, nowhere near the worst times there's ever been. It's it's bad. It's yeah. bad, but it's not, you know, um, we're broad. We're, we are freely broadcasting without the fear of arrest or death. We are freely broadcasting the word of God right now. It is not the worst time ever. Right. And, you know, that in, 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 in Israel's history, like I was saying, this is awful. Like you're saying, it's there, it's there nine 11, but it happened every day. And that's, mm. that's what, um, a poem of lamentation is. Right. So you've got this author who's watching this unfold and a lamentation is like it's it's like you said, it's how, you know, it's 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 his way of 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 processing emotion and trauma and expressing uh, or voicing confusion. And, you know, how he feels about the suffering that he's experiencing and what he's seeing and what he's feeling and this this promised land, um, you know, that was given to them, you know, by God and. You know his people and his nation is is crumbling, and he's watching it happen, mm. right? And it's all of the all of these things that you know were gifts and blessings, and this wonderful place that you know God gave them is it's it's being destroyed, and yeah. he's watching it happen, and that's that's what he's how you know yeah. how, you can't, you know, like I, it's, it's confusion and it's trauma and it's pain and suffering, and that's what a poem of lamentation is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned about how some have contested the authorship being Jeremiah. Um, I think it's safe to say that um, the author is anonymous. Um, In the book, he's never named. He's anonymous. Uh, And so that that would be the most secure and conservative statement about the author. However, tradition, long-time Jewish and Christian tradition, has attributed this to Jeremiah. And I think there's a good amount of weight to be placed behind the fact that, you know, the Septuagint, the Vulgate, uh, the Septuagint is the Greek Old Testament. Um, You know, the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, and then the Septuaginta, it it means 70 in Greek. And there were 70 translators, his uh, tradition says, who translated the Hebrew into the Greek in order for the Greek-speaking nations to have it in the early centuries. And so uh, Septuaginta and then the Vulgate is uh, this, this church father named Jerome. He translated the... Um, the Bible, Old New Testament, into what we call the Latin Vulgate. He translated it into the Latin language. And both the Septuaginta and the Latin Vulgate um, hold a, uphold the tradition of Jeremiah's authorship. However, I, I, I was reading on this, and I found it really interesting that there's a guy in 1712, he was one of the first, or he was the first, in fact, to question the Jeremianic authorship. Uh, his name is H. Vonderhart. And he attributed the five chapters uh, in this book to, um, get this, I, I don't think there's any credence behind this. That's why I'm not going to del- del- delve into it as much. But he attributes the five chapters to Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and King Jehoiachin. Um, I'm not sure how. I never could find exactly how he did that. Uh, you would have to look up his book. Uh, or his writings, rather, um, and uh, and I'm pretty sure that that it's written in like German or Latin or something like that. So, um, I guess good luck on that. I don't know what to say there, <laughs> um, but I did find that interesting. Uh, I think ultimately, it's safe. It's safest to say 
the book remains anonymous in the scripture itself. Um, however, uh, very reliable, I would consider reliable tradition says, well, I think uh, Jeremiah wrote it. And it would certainly make sense that this prophet Jeremiah, who is um, undergoing this, uh, uh, watching this, this terrible, terrible sight of the people of God being trampled upon in their own city, in the city of God, um, for him to be writing these lament poems. And, uh, and they're consistent with different laments that we would find in the Psalms and, and different Psalms and whatnot. And so, um, you know, this is, this is a, a very depressing book, but I think it's very applicable to us today. At the very least, there's, you know, modern application for us. And, um, and I would say the modern application is sort of fivefold because, while I, you know, certainly didn't intend to belittle or diminish the amount of trial and tribulation that we go through today, because it's still difficult, it's still persecution and trial and tribulation for us, just because it's not weighted uh, the way that it was, or as heavy as what it was in 587 when Jerusalem was captured, or when Nero and Domitian and Vespasian and all these were in control during the early Christian periods. Um, it's still difficult and uncharted, unprecedented for us. And so, you know, we don't need to necessarily cheat ourselves out of saying, hey, we still need to persevere and look at the bright side when we do persevere. And so I think when we read Lamentations, um, to me, it really kind of boils down to a sort of fivefold um, application, modern application for us today. Uh, number one, uh, the wickedness of, of any people will eventually result in, um, in destruction of that society. And, uh, you know, we talk about what we look at and see today in our, in our culture. Um, the wickedness of any people will result in the disintegration and the destruction of that society. And we see that occurring right now in our culture. Um, God being removed from the schools, sports, even sports for, I'm not talking about sports like NFL, NBA. I'm talking about sports like Little League being elevated to a more uh, prioritized status than the relationship of a child in the church. Um, you know, I mean, I was talking to one of our elders just the other day about how, um, how we never, you know, just 15 years ago in little league, I, I never had ball games and things on, on Wednesday nights. And if I did, it was a non-negotiable. We didn't attend those. We didn't go to those. We attended our services with the assembly of God. We see things like abortion. Uh, being widely acceptable um, or you know we see people trying to justify the circumstances of abortion because of injustices that were committed to individuals and all of those things are all contributing to a wickedness of the people that is going to result in the disintegration of the society I think the second thing that we learn from this book here in our that can apply to us today is that we should never take God's past blessings as an assurance that they will continue when we continue to sin. Um, and what I mean is, you know, um, don't look and say, well, God's blessed me. So, you know, it's, it's like Romans 6, 1, you know, God's given his grace and his blessing. So I can just keep on sinning and he'll just give his grace and his blessing. Don't expect that. We see that there in Lamentations, the result of a continuation of sin there. Uh, number three, our nation and our churches, they're all subject to God's judgment. And uh, certainly to God's judgment when they are not uh, faithful. And so we might see ourselves going through a period of a sort of dirge in our political system and our um, in our culture as far as people's respect and reverence of God. Um, you know, we see the use of OMG at a heightened sense than ever before God's name in vain and, you know, all these different things. Um, 
you know, when our nation, our churches are not faithful to God, um, they'll face and they'll be subject to God's judgment. Uh, number four, God always fulfills his word, right? Uh, there's never been a time where God has not fulfilled his word. He always does and he always will. And then number five, um, though there's many solutions for human suffering, uh, that's that's been you know proposed by individuals. Ultimately, the only satisfactory way to deal with human suffering is through deep and abiding faith in God, in spite of any and every circumstance. It's understanding that the only one and only thing that can heal our hurt and our brokenness is God. In his word, in his teaching. And when you rely on that, all those other implications and applications that come from this text, they're all corrected because God fulfills his word and God provides the healing and the mending in the midst of a broken and damned world. And, and so when we rely fully on God, when we fully rely on God, um, Lamentation shows us even in the midst of destruction, there's hope. There's peace. Uh, there's a chance. And so I think those are the things that we can kind of learn from this book as we, um, as we read it and study it, even outside of the verse that we're looking at tonight. And um, just going off some of the stuff that you said, and that's kind of what, you know, what limitations leads to, especially like the verses that we're looking at is, is the, the author saying that, you know, God is, 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 is faithful and he will follow through on his promise. Right. If we are being wicked, then wickedness will be punished. Mm. Right. Look at Jerusalem and you look at what they're they're going through. Right. You look at, you know, the, the punishment that they're experiencing that's coming through, you know, Babylon. Right. And, and, and you know, and, and, you know, siege being laid on Jerusalem and everything. Um, and, you know, that's that's God. That's that's God doing what he promised he would do. But then the author is also saying, look, if he's faithful enough to go through with his punishment, that he's faithful enough to make sure that this evil doesn't reign forever. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and he's, you know, he's he's faithful enough to punish, but at the same time, he's faithful enough to save us. Uh, yeah, and that, that's exactly right. I've talked before about the day of the Lord that you see throughout the Old Testament prophecies and even in Re Revelation. The day of the Lord, the day of judgment, we always view that as a negative day, but it's actually a positive day for those who are faithful. You know, it's a positive day for those who are faithful because on the day of the Lord, it will be a day of either destruction for the unfaithful or deliverance for the faithful. You know, we read verses like 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 and 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, uh, where it talks about how God is patient and compassionate and not willing that anyone should perish. And we understand and believe this wholeheartedly. God does not want any, any to perish. But we have to also look that God is just. He is faithful to fulfill His Word. And His Word also tells us that whenever all warnings are ignored, nothing remains but His judgment. And we should never presume um, that, that we're entitled to God's mercy and compassion. He freely gives it. Uh, but we have to obey him. We have to we have to love him and love people, love others as ourselves. And I really believe that the book of Lamentation here uh, it, it contains this implied warning that sometimes at, at some point, at some point, it will be too late to weep and repent. At some point, it will be too late. And what we have to make sure is that we remain faithful to God always. We have to make sure that we weep and repent before it is too late, that we're baptized into Christ before it is too late. And how do you make sure you do that? You do it now, at this moment. You, you Maybe you're watching and you realize, yeah, one day it will be too late. You know, this is not a doom and destruction lesson. It's certainly a book about doom and destruction, Lamentations is. But the whole point here is to say there were, there's coming a day. There's coming a day where we will all face um, the judgment of God. And He will either deem us as faithful 
because he is faithful or he will deliver us to the destruction that we asked for by our disobedience and ignoring all of the warnings and so um, how do you how do you make sure that you don't wait until it's too late right now right now you know uh four seven eight seven five seven nine four three five isn't that a weird thing to do <laughs> it's like an infomercial right uh, but seriously though call, call right now you want to get get in the baptistry let's so you can be baptized study the word of god and remain faithful to him uh, we want to be there for you so that you can do that because it's the greatest blessing that god has ever given us the ability to be forgiven of our sins and to be mended and healed from our hurt and brokenness. And so uh, right now. And um, when you read through the book of Lamentation and you see um, chapter one and then two and, and throughout the, the book, there's there's these figures that are, you know, described. Um, there's a, a lady and then there's uh, a man and uh, a couple other people that are these figures that are just, you know, they're fictional and they're just, you know, you being used to get a point across and those figures are being used to express the pain and the confusion and the suffering and mm. the languages, you know, it describes the death of a loved one and it's mourning like a funeral, like, um, you know, like, like, like a family member of mine has just died and, you know, there's nothing I can do about it now. You know, it's too late mm. and there's all of this pain and trauma and just this, this, all of these terrible things that these people are feeling. And then, because it's too late for you know for Israel and Jerusalem to repent now, but then, then you get to chapter three and you get to the verses that we're going to study today, and these are the only collection of verses in the Book of Lamentation that are hopeful. Mm, yeah, yeah. Right? They're hopeful because of one reason: in the midst of all of this chaos, in the midst of all of these terrible, awful things that are going on. The trauma and the pain that these people are experiencing, the pain that this author is experiencing, like the death of a loved one, and like he and like you know this this nation is crying out, but no one's coming to comfort them because it's too late. In the midst of all this, you have a collection of verses of hope. Yeah. And that hope comes from one place. Yeah. And it's God. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. Um, yeah. So you know Thad alluded to the, the sort of poetic. Um, structure, the linear, the the, the ordered and linear uh, structure of of this book, and so um, what you have in this book, you know, all these poems, they they're a way to process their emotions and what they're seeing, a way to uh, uh, voice their confusion and and to protest even what's going on, wow. and so. And so, yeah, yeah, how, how could this happen? Um, and so what you see in the first four chapters is an acrostic. Now, an acrostic is, uh, it's, it's literally um, an alphabet poem. So it's like an acrostic would be pray. And it would say, you know, P stands for praise God always. And R stands for repent of your sins. And A stands for ask God your concerns and why stands for yield to God's direction. You know, it, it's a word and each letter of the word begins a sentence or a thought. So that's what an acrostic is. So in the Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 letters and uh, we don't see this in the English because of the way it translates, but the very first chapter of Lamentations has 22 verses and each verse begins with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, uh, Dalit, and, and so on. And so um, in chapter 1, we see this lady, uh, Lady Zion. And, and, and Lady Zion, it's, this, it's the holy city of God, right? And, and they're expressing their grief of the devastation and, and the thing, that the destruction that has happened. Then in chapter 2, guess what? There's 22 verses, and each of those 22 verses begins with one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And in chapter 2, I find it real fascinating. That first verse kicks off and says, How the Lord in his, uh, how the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. 
God's people are under a cloud, just like they were under a cloud in the Exodus. But this right. cloud is not a cloud of deliverance It's and, and protection and direction. It's a cloud of destruction. It's a cloud of God's wrath. And God is slow to, to anger, but he will judge human evil. And we have to understand that. But we also have to understand that divine wrath is not volatile anger. It's God's justice. It's the justice uh, against a people who have acted so disorderly. So chapter 2 is an acrostic as well. You get to chapter 3 and uh, uh oh, there's 66 verses. Well, get this. When you divide 66 by 3, what do you get? 22. Every three verses begins with the successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So it would be like this. Verses 1, 2, and 3 all begin with A. Verses 4, 5, and 6 all begin with B, and so on. So it's an acrostic as well, and we'll come back to the meaning of it. Chapter 4, 22 verses, an acrostic. And, and, and it, in chapter 4, there's this uh, discussion about the past and uh, how people have, have been fulfilled and had all their all the food and, and rulership and everything that they needed and wanted and desired in the past. But now, because of the siege of Jerusalem, those same people who found themselves on a mountaintop now find themselves beneath the valley, crawling in the dirt to find anything that they could eat. Rulers being carried off in chains. Then in chapter 5, there's 22 verses, but it's not an acrostic. And this is a communal prayer. It's a prayer for God's mercy. And the book ends with that prayer. O oh Lord, uh, you, you reign as king forever. And then the book ends when he says, you know, when will you forgive? Uh, when will you, uh, uh, or, or why rather, I, I draw a blank on the, the very wording, but uh, why do you forget and forsake your people? Okay, and so it, it ends with this very confusing, well, where are we headed? And that's very much like our disorder, um, like the pain and grief and confusement that we have. Where's it going to end? God wins the deliverance. We understand that you reign and last and live forever. So when are you going to deliver us from, from this? Pour your mercy and grace upon us. And just to mention before Thad says what he's going to say, but you know, the first four chapters, you have this acrostic linear form, and it's almost like you're watching the author provide order in the, in, the, in the form of writing, providing order in the midst of him viewing this disordered pain and grief and confusement. I wasn't going to say anything. I was okay. just kind of continuing what you were saying. Gotcha. So then we get to chapter 3. And uh, this is where Thad is exactly right. I mean, you, you have these other chapters, you know, 1, 2, 4, and 5 are all, they're not just laments. I mean, it is destruction. It is, you know, these laments and crying out that God will please, will you restore a sacred dignity to this human suffering? And, um, and you really have that in chapter 3 as well. You have it all throughout chapter 3. And I just want to read a little bit here. Look at verse 10 of chapter 3. Uh, he is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kindness the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughingstock of all peoples, the object of their taunts. All day long, he has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say, my endurance, it has perished. My hope from the Lord has perished. Remember my afflictions and my wanderings. The wormwood and the gall, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. You see what's going on with the author here? Completely destroyed. Devastated. Devastated. I mean, the word does. He says, uh, and maybe we've gotten to this place before where we, 
we've gone through troubles in our life. We've gone through trials. And uh, we might even get to the point and say, God, where you at? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and cry out, God, God, where are you at? I'm supposed to have hope in the peace and comfort that comes from you. Where are you at right now? And uh, even the author here, he says, uh, you know, I have I have nothing left. My endurance has perished. I have nothing left. I can't keep enduring. I can't keep standing firm. I can't keep going on. I'm tired. I, I, I'm, I'm tired. I'm weak. And I have nothing left. Have you ever felt that way, Thad, where you, you're just like, I, I just don't have anything left. I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to do. And just the frustration could, is just is just oozing out of you. Let me, let me, let me just say this real quick and we're going to get into this, but it's, it's, I'm going to save this comment for later. Go ahead. Well, and then, um, it applies later. Yeah. Well, you know, there's this, this feeling of desertion that God is, uh, completely deserted, uh, the Mm -hmm. people. And, uh, he says, even my hope in God, it's perished. It's Mm -hmm. gone. And it's almost as if like he hears, have you ever done this Thad, where like you hear what you're saying and you go, wait a minute. Yeah. Wait a second. Huh? Maybe I don't need to say that. Wait a minute. You know, that's not the God that I know. I, I, I need, have you ever said something you kind of like double check? Like, Oh, I don't really mean what I just said. Let me take a step back. <laughs> You know, and and in the midst of this, you know, smack dab in the middle of all five of these poems, smack dab in the middle, <coughs> verses 22, 21 through 23, the author completely changes his tone. He completely changes his attitude. Verse 21, after he says, I've lost my hope. And he, and he basically, it's like he's laying down to die. You know, my soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. Verse 21. But, wait a minute. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. What is it that he calls to mind? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It never ends. In the midst of him watching September 11th for their people, the destruction and dying in the city, uh, September 11th for that, you know, it's not, I'm not saying it's actually September 11th for those who just joined. I'm saying this was their 9-11, okay? But it was, their 9-11 happened every single day. It wasn't just one time, it was every day, destruction over and over. In the midst of the author, presumably Jeremiah, watching all of this death and destruction and God forsaking his people, bringing judgment to his people. That's what the author thinks, that God's forsaken his people. It's in reality him providing the justice that is needed. But in the midst of all of this, he stops after he says, my hope is lost, my endurance is gone. He stops and he remembers it was never his endurance that he was supposed to live on. You see, it's it's crazy, Thad, how all these verses really fit together because when we go back to the verse you, we studied with you, your favorite verse in Philippians in chapter 2, and then mine in Philippians 4, it was never about our confidence. It was never about our way. It was never about our will. It was never about our endurance. It was always about God endurance. Right. And he realizes, this is the one thing I recall, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And his mercies, they never come to an end. Th- that word mercies in the Hebrew is chesed, okay? And uh, it, it's loving kindness, continual loving kindness because of the covenant that was made between God and his people. God is faithful to fulfill the covenant even when we are not so the author says, his love never ceases, his mercies never end. Great. Or first he says, they are new every morning, every single day. Great is your faithfulness, God. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. He is enough. He is what I need. And therefore, I will place my hope, not in people, not in the destruction of the city, but in God and God alone. 
And what I was going to say earlier is when, whenever we're in distress and whenever, you know, there's this, you know, things going on around us that, you know, scare us or they hurt us or, you know, maybe we, we lose a loved one or we lose a job or we get really bad news and we're, we're, you know, in the midst of this, you know, chaos that we see in our life or in our world around us. And, you know, we're hurting and we're sad and, you know, like the people of, you know, the people of Israel, um, and we're, we, we pray to God because we believe in God. And we know that he can make things better. And we pray to him. We say, God, please help us through this. Please fix this. Please do something about this. And sometimes, sometimes we don't see his answer. And sometimes we don't see him working just like that because God's not a vending machine. And when we don't get what we want right when we want it, that's when we start to question, mm. right? But yeah, here's the good. thing. Here's the thing. When it comes to that excruciating period of waiting between when you ask something from God and when he answers, that space between that time of waiting, that's when faith becomes crucial. Hmm. That's when you have to believe that God is always there. Yeah. That God yeah. is always looking after you, and He knows what He is doing. Mm. Yeah. Right. And I feel like so often we just—I I feel like so often we we just you know throw these things up to God and we say, "Hey, do something about this." And sometimes we—I feel like we just you know we get it in our head that we just wait for you know God to come to us when we're the ones that are supposed to be going to God. Mm. Yeah. And maybe He—that's exactly what He's waiting for. You know, maybe that's his answer. Why don't you come after me instead of, you know, why? I feel like I feel like sometimes we just we lose sight of it hmm. and we just question him when he's 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 not the one that moved. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. God doesn't move. Right. And we say, where did you go? Where did you go? And uh, it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> I never moved. It was me. Right. It was me that moved, not God. It was us that moved, right? And, um, it, you know, actually, like, I, I don't say that in, in, in a form of judgment. I say that in a form of hope that God never moved. Uh, and if we just realize and confess that, back. yeah, if we just realize that we moved, then, then we can go back to him. He's waiting right there on the porch to, to run up to us and to hug our neck and kiss us and to cut us off when we, when we are telling him that we should be no, no better than the servants, the slaves. And, and he says, no, I'm going to give you a fattened calf and I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you all the treasures uh, of my inheritance so that you can, you can share with me and, and the treasures of glory. And uh, that's, that's our God. And in the midst of all of this destruction, what's going on? You know, this author here realizes, wait a minute, it, my hope really hasn't perished. My confidence has not perished because it was never confidence in myself or people. It was always confidence in God. And uh, people can let us down a lot, very often. Uh, and, and that's when we rely on God. Because people have always let people down. And we'll, we'll do it. I'll let people down. But our confidence is in God. Uh, I, I, we're running out of time, so I just want to get to a comment that was made uh, uh, Mac qu asked a question and said, in chapter 3, verses 60 through 66, the author writes a prayer of vengeance. How is this acceptable and how was it answered? Um, well, we might want to take a closer look at that you know, in another video, but we will try to answer a little bit here uh, because it actually connects pretty, pretty decently well with these verses here. Um, first of all, these verses, you know, Lamentations three twenty one to twenty three, are a are some of the most popular scriptures in all the Bible, and they're the only beacon of light. You know, it's like a diamond and a handful of coal. You know, it's the only beacon of light in the entire book. Uh, these people facing destruction and and hurt right now. We're facing a virus and we're facing unrest and upeasiness and, and uneasiness and all of the. the all of the thing that we're this we're, that we're facing right now in this world, um, and and you know, we have hope because the Lord's the love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning, and, and great is His faithfulness to fulfill His word. It reminds me of what we said just two weeks ago in the lesson about trust and righteousness, and, and we looked at Habakkuk there. Even if. Even if there's no fruit, even if there's nothing growing, even if I find destruction, even if 
I don't get my way. Even still, I will trust in the Lord. I will obey Him. That's because the confidence that we can have in God. And the writer here of Lamentations realizes that. Go ahead, Thad. All right, and, and what you're saying, I just want to want to get on this while you're while you're talking about this, and that you know, even if that you know that that's found so many places in Scripture, hmm. you know, it's 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 found in, in in Daniel with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where you know they refuse to bow. You know, when you, you you've got you know all of these people, this nation of people who are bowing down, and you've got these guys standing up, right? And then they're called before the king, who, mind you, was the most powerful man on the planet at that time, hmm. and they look this man in the eyes and they say. We're not afraid of you, and nothing that you threaten us with, nothing that you do to us is going to cause us to turn our backs on God. And they say, because we know that our God is capable of delivering us from your hand. Mm. And then they say, but even if, even if we knew no one was coming to help us, it's not, it's not that they were doubting God. They, they, they knew that he was capable and would help them, but they said, even if, even if he doesn't, we're still not going to turn our back on him because we know that he's here for us. Yeah. We know he loves us because the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases and his mercies never come to an end. And, and there's something there's something greater than what we have in this world. You know, that's the thing that we have to realize is this world is not our home. You know, we like you know, okay, if I go to somebody else's home and like, you know, their their grass gets trampled on or you know, like the paint on their walls is falling off. You know, I feel bad for them, but you know, like I'm not going to get so up, up in, I'm not going to get so, um, um, you know, off put and angry about it. You know, it's not my home. It's not my home. You know, it's, it's somebody else's home and they've got to take care of that. My home, my home is in heaven with the Lord. And, and while I'm here, I want it to be the best that it can be. And God wants us to live a fulfilling life as well. And so we do need to have concern for things in our culture and society. But that concern, it derives from our love of God and love for people. It, it derives from our love of the souls of others. That's, the, that's where our concern comes from. Our concern is not so that we can make the greatest country and all this that, that's ever been. Our concern is so that we can grow the kingdom. And whenever we're growing the kingdom, we're going to find ourselves in a much better position, understanding the hope that is in the Lord. Hey, you know, I'll just mention this. Um, Thad, when it came to the Great Commission, was the Great Commission slowed down during the Reagan administration? No. Uh, was the was the Great Commission slowed down during the Clinton administration? No. No. What about Bush's administration? I don't know where you're going. Or Obama's no. administration? Was the greatest was the was the was the was the, was the Great Commission to go into all the world and make disciples? Was it slowed down or halted during Nero's reign? No. Domitian's reign? No. During the during the darkest ages of 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 history? No. Will it be slowed down whether Trump or Biden's president or whoever holds that office and sits in that pretty white house? No. We respect and we do our part, but we understand that it will never be slowed down because God is in control. And his ways are greater than our ways and our and his thoughts greater than our thoughts. And the author realizes that. And so he goes, I love verse 25. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the that's soul. That's a big word. <laughs> who wait. That's right. Who wait for him in his time. I just said that, right? His thoughts, his ways greater than our thoughts and our ways. Wait for him. Wait for his ways. It's good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. You know, all the way through verses 39, the speaker here emphasizes God's goodness, his justice, his, his, uh, his lordship. And then verses 40 through 57, he petitions the people to join him in prayer, in prayer for restoration, because he does want to have good, profitable life. And so he petitions God to bring about that and then you get to verses 48 through 66, and this is where the speaker continues his efforts to lead people back to God. And so in verses 48 to 51, he describes his grief over Jerusalem's predicament, where they find themselves at. 
verses 52 to 54, he declares what the enemy has done, what they've done to these people. And then in verses 59 uh, through 66, the verse that Mac, uh, the section that Mac asked a question back about, uh, this section, uh, the author here, he he asked with with a boat of confidence. He asked that God will punish the foes of Jerusalem. And this is the same thing that David does in the Psalms over and over and over again. God, deliver me from my enemies and oppressors. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times he does it. Deliver me from my, my enemies and my oppressors. And that's what happens here. It says, you have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my case. You have seen all their vengeance, all their plots against me. You have heard their taunts, O Lord, all their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold, they're sitting and they're rising. I am the object of their taunts. You will repay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You will give them dullness of heart. You will cur Your curse will be on them. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under your heavens, O Lord. Lord. It's, it's just, it just sounds like confidence. It is. It's confidence that God will bring about the deliverance and destruction of, of the enemies, ultimately the enemies of God. Listen, Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk, he cries out, God, how much longer? And God says, okay, I'll, I'll send the Chaldeans, or the Chaldeans are the Babylonians. Um, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, He'll, he'll watch back later, I'm sure. Okay, so um, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they cry out and say, Hey, um, our, our God says, I'll send the Babylonians and the Chaldeans to deliver. And Habakkuk's like, Oh, I don't want to, you know, they're even worse. Those people don't even recognize you as God. And uh, later, how are the Babylonians destroyed? God delivers them. You read through the prophets and you see that God delivers even those who were, um, I believe it's in Joel. Um, maybe in Micah or Joel, where God says, uh, yeah, you know, the Israelites in Jerusalem, they're going to be destroyed, but so will all those nations who come in and conquer them. He uses the Babylonians to teach those in Jerusalem a lesson. He uses the Persians to come and destroy the Babylonians. The Greek destroy the Persians. The Romans come in and destroy the Greeks. And where does it end? Well, it ends with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ coming in with his kingdom with his way, with his direction. And so that is uh, the prayer for vengeance. You know, we look at Romans yeah. chapter 12, and we know vengeance belongs to the Lord. We understand that the Lord's vengeance will come. And uh, our prayer is much the same today. Maybe it's not as bold in the in the way that in the words that we use, but our prayer is much the same, isn't it, Thad? I mean, we say, hey, God, deliver us from evil. You know, and conquer, conquer those who are evil against us, um, and he will. His judgment will come. His justice will reign, and he'll bring his vengeance upon those who are evil and evil doers, uh, who are wicked and against his word. But the faithful. Now this goes back to Habakkuk, right? It's amazing how Habakkuk did, did Habakkuk maybe write this book? I'm just kidding. Just kidding, just kidding. All right, but it's amazing, right? Because it goes back to Habakkuk. What does he say? Listen, Habakkuk, just remain faithful. And those who remain faithful, you will be called righteous. Remember what he says? The righteous shall live by faith. What, what is our faith in? Our faith is in a God whose steadfast love endures forever, whose mercies never come to an end. A faith in a God knowing that His love and His mercy is new every morning. And great is his faithfulness, so great must our faithfulness be. He is our portion, he is enough, and we will place our hope in him. And the Lord will be good to those who wait on him, who wait for his salvation. And one thing that I want to add before we wrap it up is, it, whatever we're facing these, you know, when you know trials and and when when we experience pain and, and and you know you know stuff like that stuff that makes us uncomfortable stuff that hurts stuff that makes us sad and, you know stuff that makes us ask questions you know it is it is important to realize that God is never he's not going anywhere and he's there but i think it's also important for us to have a mindset of this is happening in my life and it's happening for a reason mm. god is he's allowing me to experience this because at the end of the day he is in control 
So I do think it is important for us to go into those situations or be in those situations with the mindset of what can I learn from this? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's because good. Because when we experience pain, we are learning. Hmm. Whether we know it or not and how we deal with that situation is going to help us to help someone else hmm. later in life. Because after that, we're going to become stronger. We're yeah. going to become smarter. And we're going to be able to pass on our knowledge of how we got through that situation. And we're going to be able to pass that on to other people. So it's important to go into those to, – to, to be in those situations knowing that God is there, knowing that God is faithful and he's never going to go anywhere. But it's also important to know that there is something that we can learn from what's going on in our lives, whether it's something good or it's something bad. There is knowledge there. There is wisdom there. Mm. And, and, and there is something that we can take away from every single thing that we experience in life, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. And I think it's really important for us to go into that, we got those types of things with that mindset. Yeah. Yeah, when we have the mindset that, uh, you know, we're in a battle every day, but God wins the war. Um, and that we can learn something and grow from the things that we're going through. Uh, praise our God for being a deliverer. Praise our God for his steadfast love and his unending mercies. Praise him from whom all blessings flow and praise him for his faithfulness and fulfilling his word. You're absolutely right, Thad, and that's a great way to really conclude this uh, this evening. Mac, that, that's a great question. I appreciate you asking the question earlier. Please, everybody who's watching, listening, ask us those questions and uh, send us your favorite verses or verses that you would like us to look at. Again, tonight's verse, Lamentations 3, 21 through 23, a great reminder of who's in control and the love and blessings that flow from him. No matter what's going on around us in our world, we can have confidence that God will deliver and God will prevail. So praise God for his great love and mercy. All right, Thad, next week we are going to be jumping back into the New Testament and studying Romans chapter 8, verses 28. And we'll look at uh, one of Thad's favorites, one of my favorites, Absolutely. So we're going to look at that next week. And that is also one of the more misunderstood Bible verses. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It, it's, it's, it, 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 it may not mean exactly what you think it means. Yeah. And I, I, I learned that on my, you know, I, I figured that out. Um, actually, you know, when, when, you know, I was, I was going through a tough time, Yeah. you know, and I figured that out and you know, it, it may not mean what you think it means. Yeah, so I'm excited for Thad to tell us some of that next week and us uh, learn about that first. Guys, thank you once again for joining. We appreciate you and love you so much. I hope this has been an encouragement to you. For God's steadfast love endures forever and His mercies never end. They are new every morning and great is His faithfulness. He is our portion. He is enough and we will place our hope in Him. If you have any ever any need, or concern, or question, or just need to reach out and talk, don't go through this life alone. We're here for you. God bless and have a good night.